I am Travis Jones. I am the uh, president of the Cleveland Coding Society, 2020-2021 uh, uh, season, I guess you could call it. Um, we've had uh, quite the challenging year this year with, and last year with all the COVID and such. And since we're a very social-oriented uh, group, you know, we bring people together so that they can uh, exchange ideas and uh, learn from one another and uh, establish connections. It's made it very difficult to actually fulfill our goals. But we came up with something, and that's what we're doing right now. A uh, virtual meeting where, you know, we get together and talk a little bit like we have among ourselves for a little bit and then jump into a presentation. Uh, technical in nature. Um, I'd like to thank our own, our members, the members of the Cleveland Coding Society. Without you, there is not a Cleveland Coding Society. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, or you know somebody that uh, has not renewed recently, to uh, encourage them to renew their memberships. Uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that we've got people here from other societies and uh, from uh, other areas other than Cleveland and welcome you to uh, this virtual uh, talk. Tonight's speaker, uh, who's, uh, the, the, the title of his talk is Surfactants, Chemistry, Theory, Mechanism, Application. His name is Sam Morell, uh, sammorell.com if you want to look him up there on the web. Sam Morell is a chemical engineering graduate of New York University and founder of sammorell.com especially chemicals consulting firms. His work experience includes both technical and marketing positions at Roman Haas, BASF, and Air Products and Chemicals. Sam has authored numerous technical art articles on additives, pigments, and resins in a wide variety of publications, including PCI Magazine, Coding Squirrel, The American Ink uh, Maker, and Adhesives Age. He has also presented technical papers, short courses, workshops at various regional, national, and international symposiums, including the American Coding Show, the Waterborne Symposium, the European Coding Show, and Coding Trends and Technology. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Sam so he can begin his presentation and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, SP Morel. Great. Th thank you, Travis. I'm going to share my screen now. I just want to make sure that you can, um, you can see this. Right. So here comes a drop of water. It's hitting the surface. It's crowning up, as you can see. And then, of course, what emerges from that will be something very interesting in terms of surface tension. I'm just going to pause the video right about here. So when we look at this, for example, I'm gonna highlight what's going on actually right here at this interface. This is quite interesting. On this spherical glob of water that we've got here, we've also got some forces that are taking place right at that interface. There's a lot of interesting things that are going on that's bringing all those molecules right to the core of that spherical um, mo uh, molecule. And so what I wanted to share with you is exactly what's going on there and how do surfactants affect that particular surface or that particular interface. So our subject today is about, of course, surfactants, theory, mechanism, and application. And here's some of the topics I'm going to review. The definition, a formal definition of what a surfactant actually does, the various types of surfactants that are out there in the marketplace. We'll talk about some structures. How do they look chemically? We'll get into just a little bit of chemistry so you can appreciate how materials behave the way they do with respect to intermolecular attractive forces and surface tension to begin with. We'll review some surface activity concepts and then we'll finish it off with some measuring methods in terms of how do you measure surface tension on both an equilibrium and on a dynamic condition. So first, let's talk about a definition. 
The word itself, surfactant, is actually a contraction of three words, surface, active, agent. And a surfactant can be defined as such, any substance, and that means any substance, which will significantly reduce the surface tension of a liquid at a very low concentration. But within that definition, there's still a lot of confusion by some people by what do we mean when we say surface tension? What is actually going on? What's tense at the surface to begin with? And why do I say at a very low concentration? Because in fact, that is a formal definition. We, we certainly can reduce the surface tension of water by adding alcohol into it. The problem with that is you would require copious amounts of alcohol to reduce that surface tension. And I'll show you data about that later on. So I'm being very particular about the fact that it's gonna be at a very low concentration, anywhere between 0.1 to 1%, not 50 parts of alcohol with 50 parts of water to get to the same surface tension reduction. So that's a definition. Types. The whole world of surfactants can actually be broken down into two basic groups. They could either be non-ionic, where there's no charge associated with the surfactant, or they can be ionic. There is a charge. Specifically, they could be anionic, which is a negatively charged species. They could be cationic, which is a positively charged species, or they can be amphoteric. They can actually go either way, negative or positive, depending on the pH. Uh, some people call them, instead of amphoteric, zwitter ionic. You may have heard that term. Zwitter is a German word, which means hermaphrodites. Uh, these are actually organisms that have both male and female sex organs, like snails and worms and things of that sort. So they can go either way, depending on the pH. If it's a low pH, they'll be positively charged cationic ions. If it's a high pH, they'll be negatively charged anions. And basically in the coatings world, what we see mostly is broken up between non-ionic and anionic. It's very rare that you go across amphoterics in the coatings industry, and there may be a little cationics in some polymers, but mostly non-ionic and anionic uh, types of types of, of surfactants. And, and here are the types that we're talking about. On a non-ionic side, you've got alkyl phenol ethoxylates, acetylenic diols, polyalkylene oxides, alcohol ethoxylates, polydimethylsiloxane, or silicone surfactants. On the anionic side, you've got things like things that are based on, for example, sulfur. So we've got uh, yeah, things like sulfates and sulfonates and sulfosuccinates, or things that can be based on phosphorus for phosphates, or even fluoro. I think there's a couple of people here from a fluorosurfactant producer, and certainly they would know about this. They can be, so these are all the anionic or polyatomic uh, ions is what we call. So, and then there's others. We've got betanes, which are these amphoteric surfactants that I mentioned before. They can go either way, depending on the pH. We've got reactive surfactants that are very interesting to use, for example, in addition polymerization or, or condensation polymerization in terms of working themselves into the backbone. Generally, they're anionic in nature so that you have less leaching and water sensitivity issues. Or here's a good example of a cationic. Uh, this is dimethyl dioctadecyl ammonium chloride. Um, so say that three times fast, but dioctadecyl, that's an 18 carbons. You can call it disterol if you'd like, uh, you know, octadecyl and sterol are the same terminology, but that's an example of a cationic surfactant. So basically what we're talking about, you've got the non-ionics over here, you've got the anionics over here, you've got a cationic over here, just to show you that there's a whole world of surfactants that are out there that can be used for so many purposes. So let's look at some of the structures of some of these surfactants. What do they look like molecular wise? So the first one I'm going to start with, which is a very common and a very popular surfactant, uh, are called alkyl phenol ethoxylates. And by the way, a lot of people are trying to replace these things because in the sewage treatment plants, for example, in the streams, they can break down to the component of the hydrophobe, which could be a phenolic group, and that could uh, lead to bioaccumulation. So people are trying to get away from this, but there's a preponderance of these surfactants that are still being used from emulsion polymerization to wetting and all sorts. And this is what it looks like. So here's an alkyl phenol ethoxylates. And what I wanted to draw your attention to, on one side, you've got a hydrophobic component. Hydro means water, phobia means to fear or to hate. So it's water fearing, water hating. And generally that R group over here, generally the most popular ones are nonyl phenol, or octal phenol, nine or eight carbons. So you got a phenol there. And on the right-hand side, you've got the hydrophilic 
Hydro, again, water. Philia is to like or to love. So you've got a water-hating component and a water-loving component. And I call this structure an AB structure. If you think of A as being the hydrophobe, B is the hydrophil, that's the makeup of this particular product. And if I were to show it to you in an illustration, symbolically, it would look something like this. You've got an amber-colored hydrophobe or oil-loving. Some people, instead of calling it a hydrophobe, may call it oleophil, oil-loving. It's synonymous to hydrophobe. And on the aqua side, the blue side, you've got the hydrophil, the water-loving part. So that's an example of an alkyl, very popular alkyl phenol of oxalate. Acetylenic diol. And by the way, uh, this is meant to be non-commercial whatsoever. I'm not going to mention companies or trade names. Uh, my purpose here is strictly educational to understand structures of surfactants and how they work. This is a very interesting molecule. And by the way, I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't represent any of these companies. So I'm kind of clean from all that. Here's what this looks like. Here you've got a, a what they call a tetramethyl desine diol. And the combination of the triple bond right here, the, and the two hydroxyl groups right over here creates a domain of high electron density, uh, giving that molecule a lot of polarity because of that. And then on top of that, on this, both sides, you've got a lot of these methyl groups, these highly branched methyl groups, which contributes to the hydrophobic property. So here we have a good example of an ABA surfactant, where B is the central hydrophil blocked on either side with a hydrophobe. And symbolically, it might look something like this a block copolymer of ethylene and propylene oxide. I should go back actually, because the one thing I wanted to show you, th this same company has done some interesting modifications making use of these hydroxyl groups where you can alkoxylate it, whether it's with ethylene oxide or propylene oxide. And then you have a whole series that's more hydrophilic and potentially, potentially could be used for emulsion polymerization because of that. Anyway, just wanted to uh, show you that as well. So the next interesting product are polyalkylene oxide. So here we have the inverse of what the acetylene diol is. Here you've got a central hydrophobe made up of propylene oxide. So you can do so many units of propylene oxide and you can also block it on either end with ethylene oxide. Let me go back here. So you can regulate how much of EO do you want and how much of PO do you want to regulate all the HLB, hydrophil lipophil balance of these surfactants. And so this is what we call a BAB structure. So before you saw an ABA structure, this is just the reverse, BAB. And symbolically, it might look something like this. Again, the amber is the central part, which is the hydrophobe blocked on either end with the, um, the aqua colored hydrophil. Another very interesting class of surfactants are the polydimethylsiloxane. Some people call them silicone surfactants. And basically what you can do, this is very interesting. You have a di, you have the, right over here, you have the dimethyl siloxane. Here's a dimethyl right over here, siloxane. You can regulate the amount of units you want in that backbone. And what will, what will happen there? If you have something like 10 uh, of those units up to a thousand, you can regulate the kinds of properties it would give you. For example, foam control with the higher hydrophobe level, you have foam control. As you slip down on the dimethyl siloxane, you get some slip control or flow and leveling. And all the way down to more like a, a, a 10 units of this, you get some good wetting characteristics over low energy surfaces. And the people who produce this have come up with different hybrids. You can imagine, for example, you could take that, that, that pendant group, that side group, that methyl group, and decide to take that alkyl and regulate how many of those units you want whether it's one methyl group or you can go up to 10 groups, a decil group, and now you're affecting the surface tension. So the surface tension of water is normally uh, regulated by dynes per, you know, the units are usually dynes per centimeter. Some people call it millinewtons per meter, which I've list, shown up there as well. Some people call it joules per, uh, per centimeter squared. They're all the same terms, basically, surface tension. Water has a very high surface tension of 72 dynes per centimeter. Dyne is a force, Centimeters of distance, takes that much force to separate them. And if you include something that could be a decil group, or uh, I mean, ten, 10, yeah, decil group instead of a methyl group, you can go down to 32 dynes per centimeter at a 0.1% concentration. And a pentyl group, it would be 26. And on a methyl group, all the way down to 21 dynes per centimeter. That's pretty low. So you can regulate that. And then there's hybrids of this. You can take not only that, you can regulate how much of those units you want of the dimethyl siloxane, 
And you could take that methyl, that alkyl group and replace it with other groups. For example, they've used aryl groups or polyether groups or polyester groups or fluorocarbon groups if you want some stain repellency, for example, built into that surfactant. The other thing you could do with that methyl group is replace it with a reactive component, hydroxyl. Imagine that you've got an hydroxyl there. So if you have any isocyanate in the binder, that will react with that hydroxyl to form some sort of a urethane there. Or you can change it to a carboxyl or an acrylic or an epoxy. My point is this particular foundation of a silicone surfactant is more than just the word silicone. They can regulate this in so many different ways, molecular weight wise, activity level wise, reactive groups wise, and come up with an array of different performance properties. Generally, they use polyether, I'll tell you that. And generally, if I had to look at the structure, it might look something like this, where you have a central hydrophil based on all this ethylene oxide, and it's blocked on either end with propylene oxide. So here again, we've got similar to the acetylene diol, we've got an ABA structure. And to, to put something in ionic perspective, here's a sodium alkyl sulfate. So the sodium, the, the hydrophobe portion over here might be a dodecyl or some people call it laurel. And then you've got a sulfate group over here. Now you've got a salt. You have a polyatomic ion here. You have a sodium salt of a sulfate group. And um, we're now we're showing you an example of an AB ionic. By the way, the reason I'm going through this ABA and AB and ionic and all that, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna show a table to show examples of what, how it affects surface tension on both, on, under both equilibrium and dynamic conditions. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of drawing these conclusions and showing you these hydrophils, hydrophobes in that, in that uh, nomenclature. Dialkyl sulfur succinate, you may have heard of this. You have, dial, you have a sulfur succinate in the, in, the, in, the, in the central part, a sodium salt of a, a succinic acid. And then you've blocked with, a, in most cases, the popular one is dioctyl. You may have heard of DOS, dioctyl sulfur succinate. And here we have now an ABA ionic. So you've seen AB ionic, ABA ionic, ABA, nine ionic, BAB, AB. I want to give you various kinds of things. So enough with the structures, just a little chemistry so you can appreciate where I'm going with this when I talk about surface tension. And we're going to talk about interactivity. Of course, when we talk about interactivity, there could be interatomic relationships, that is between atoms, and there could be intermolecular forces, attractive forces between molecules. In the interatomic, you can have covalent bonds, which either could be nonpolar, where there's an equal distribution of those electrons in the valence shell, or they could be polar, where there's not an equal distribution. Um, you can have ionic groups. We have a, one, a, a positive cation and a, and a negative anion uh, together, or metallic bonding. My point is this. In the intermolecular world, when these molecules get together, you have what we call, generically speaking, van der Waal forces, named after, if you don't know what he looks like, it's Johannes van der Waals. He came up with this concept that all molecules, no matter what their polar bond or nonpolar bond, right, have intermolecular attractive forces. And generally, the most common one that, that for nonpolar systems are London dispersion forces. They could be induced dipole. I don't want to go too crazy with this. There's a whole lecture on this separately, which are ion induced or dipole induced. Now we're getting to something a little bit stronger with respect to intermolecular attractive forces, which are dipole-dipole, right? And the strongest of them all within the dipole-dipole group is hydrogen bonding. And I want to explain to you why that's important. Hydrogen, I think a lot of people misunderstand the power of hydrogen bonding with respect to any form of chemistry, whether it's coatings or other industries to begin with. And the reason why hydrogen bonding is strong is based on the fact that the magnitude of the charges between the two atoms, this relates to Coulomb's law. I don't want to go too crazy on that. The atomic radius, how close are those atoms together? And that usually is nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine in combination with hydrogen. That's what gives you hydrogen bonding. When people think of hydrogen bonding, they always think of the OH group. But that could happen with nitrogen and fluorine as well and the electronegativity difference. Again, I'm not gonna to go too crazy with this, but I just wanna show you, I have a little video that shows you, here's a typical dipole, hydrogen chloride, right? But when we compare that to the other elements that can form hydrogen bonding, in this case, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen oxide, or hydrogen nitride, those atoms are closer together. There's a smaller atomic radius. The electronegativity difference is very great. They're stronger, they're very polarizable. And that is the reason why hydrogen bonding can give you very strong intermolecular attractive forces. So if we just focus on the hydrogen oxide or what we would call hydroxide, right? 
You've got six valence electrons. There are two paired, there's two unpaired. You can set up two hydrogen there. Here is your classic water molecule. I like to call it dihydrogen monoxide. You probably don't hear it that way. You always say H2O or water. It's dihydrogen monoxide. And because of those intermolecular attractive forces, these things congregate together and form this very, very strong network. And it is very strong. If we try to separate those water molecules from themselves, the amount of energy in joules uh, that, that it would take to do that kind of work would be 41,000 joules per mole. That's, that's very strong. I mean, that, that, that hydrogen bonding is extremely strong. And if you try to even separate the water molecule, the oxygen from the hydrogens, that's even 20 times greater, 830 kilojoules per mole. So we're talking about a lot of cohesive, and that's the key word, a lot of cohesive forces between these water molecules that set up all these vector forces. You've got things to the north, to the east, to the west, to the south, in front of it, behind it. You've got basically an equilibrium state, assuming there's no external forces on those molecules, you've got something that are cohesive, all bunched in uh, together. And I wanna show you something. I kind of did an animation of this glass of water, uh, which uh, hopefully will appear next. Let's see, here we go. So we're gonna fill up our glass with water. I'm gonna take a while we're doing that too. And what I wanna do is zoom in at the surface, at the interface, and you can see all the water molecules that are there, right? The interesting thing about all this, let me get my uh, laser if I can. The interesting thing about all this is if we take a look at the molecules of water in the bulk, you have these vector forces, north, south, east, west, in front of it, behind it. So you've got a neutral force, basically. Everything cancels itself out and it stays there in equilibrium. But let's take a look at the molecules at the surface. That's a different story. You've got cohesiveness east and west and south in front, behind, but look at here, nothing on top. So the net attractive force, let me get rid of my laser there, the net attractive force is going down into the bulk as a result of all those vector forces. And because of that, we're forming a very compressive film on that surface. And the way to counteract that is by throwing surfactant molecules into that water so they can migrate to the interface. Let me just sh stop this for a moment. So they can migrate into the interface. And so there's a couple things going on here. Of course, the hydrophilic portion, these aqua colors are gonna stick in the water phase, like, likes, like. These hydrophobic tails on the, on the surface are gonna stick in the air. They don't, they're repelled by the water to begin with. So a couple things are going on. One, first of all, you're changing the facade of that interface that used to be very, very hydrophilic to something that is hydrophobic or more oil loving. So when you wanna to go to low energy surfaces, whether it's an oily panel, whether it's a, a, a low energy plastic film, for example, you need more of this, like, likes, like of this on that surface. The other thing to think about is the intermolecular attractive forces between those molecules are far less than the, high, than the water molecules because of these are London dispersion forces. All these uh, hydrocarbon uh, tails have very low molecular forces together. And the last thing I want to tell you is that you notice that they migrated right to the interface, correct? So they're exerting a surface pressure. It's sort of like vapor pressure, how you know solvents will come and escape very quickly because they're not going to be in the water phase and they have low intermolecular attractive forces. Same thing here. And, we'll, and I, the reason I bring that up, the surface pressure is because I'm going to show you a relationship between surface tension and surface pressure. They're sort of opposite of the same side of the coin, the opposite side of the same kind. So if you, if you increase surface pressure, you're basically reducing surface tension. And so we'll show you that later on. So let me just continue with that uh, animation. I'm assuming you can see this. I can't tell whether you're seeing this on your monitor. Is that, is that correct? You're seeing this? We can yes. see it. Yeah, it's, it's great. Okay. So let's move on. So enough, enough of the chemistry. I just wanted to have you a little appreciation. Sometimes people like to understand mechanistically what's going on. So let's talk about surface activity. What do I mean by surface activity? Well, there are different features of that. Surface tension, wetting, micelles, surface pressure, which I mentioned before, surface transport, and foam control. So let's deal with surface tension first. So now we can clarify a little bit about surface tensions. Now you know, by that glass of water, molecules at the surface possess a net attractive force into the bulk. 
right? And as a result of that, I'm going to show you something. Because of that cohesiveness, and particularly on the surface, is it any wonder why you can fill more of a volume of water, for example, in this test tube than the volume of the test tube itself? Because all those interactive forces. You can support things that have higher specific gravity. This is metal. These are paper clips. Or you can have these insects. These are called, um, these are water uh, spiders or, or, or striders, water striders, where they can't penetrate the surface. They're able to uh, walk on water. Here's a minnow, for example, trying to break through a, a water drop because of the surface tension being so high. The, the water drop falls off the leaf. He's okay, he comes out of it. But I just wanna show you how much forces there really are at the surface, a skin tight uh, drum. So, um, so that's surface tension. So we get that, right? At the interface, and that, when I say interface, that could be the surface, could be the sidewall of the container. As long as it's an interface, most people say surface tension. We really should call it interfacial tension because that could happen between a solid and a liquid. For example, a pigment that's in the water, you have a solid and you have the aqueous. And this the thing I showed you was the air, the gas and the liquid. So that's, let's talk about wetting. So now that we understand we can change the facade of that interface into something that used to be high energy into low energy. Imagine this, we're gonna talk about contact angles briefly. Imagine you have a freshly waxed car and you got this substrate. So I'm gonna simulate it over here. I'm gonna drop some water, a raindrop. I used to happen to use the earth. It's mostly water anyway, but just picture this. And we're gonna draw lines that are tangential to where that water drop hits that panel. And as you can see here with a very cohesive water that's very high, a hydrophobic surface with a very high surface, you have a contact angle greater than 90 degrees. If we were to add surfactant and we change the energy to something that's lower energy, right? The surface tension is reduced, we get more wetting. And now we have a contact angle that's about 90 degrees, for example. So if we even add more surfactant, a higher concentration into that water, more wetting of that substrate. Again, remember what I was saying. We're changing the facade of that liquid from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. We're relaxing. There's a lot of low intermolecular attractive forces to spread out over a very difficult to wet substrate. And so these are one way of measuring a surface tension called contact angles. Let's go on to micelles, the concept of micelles. I'm gonna fill up my screen with water. And I'm gonna take some water while we're doing that. Okay, so we're gonna add some surfactant to this petal of water, right? And you know what's gonna happen. When we add the surfactant molecules, they're gonna to rise to the interface, in this case, the surface, whereby the hydrophilic uh, ends will stick, will be tethered into the water phase. The hydrophobes don't want to be there. They're going to stick in the air and they saturate the entire surface. In the case of this is a vessel, they'll saturate all the interfaces, the side walls, if it's glass, metal, doesn't make a difference. All the interface will be saturated. So here's the question. What would happen if we add more surfactant molecules and the surface is completely saturated and they can't, they can't uh, bulldoze their way through? What will they do? The next lowest energy state for them to be in is to congregate together and form what we call micelles, where the hydrophobes are all in the core, in the center, because like, likes like, and all those hydrophilic ends will stay in the aqueous phase where they're very happy. That's the next best case. And in fact, when we're at that case, we are what we call at the critical micelle concentration. You may have heard of CMC. When all the interfaces are saturated with surfactant molecules, and we're adding more surfactants, the next best lower energy state is for them to congregate together. They have no other choice. They have to do that because they're not miscible in water. And they come in different forms. You see a cylindrical form here. They're like pin cushions, spherical in nature. And of course, this is the basis of why emulsion polymerization takes place or air bubbles take place to begin with. So let me, let me explain. Here comes a, a very oleophilic, oil-loving or hydrophobic water-hating monomer, for example it will find itself into the domain of the micelle. You throw in an initiator in there, it'll migrate also into that domain. And of course the initiator will form, you know, you get initiation, you get propagation, termination, you, you're converting a monomer to a dimer, to an oligomer, to a polymer, and you're stabilizing it with all these surfactant molecules on the outside to form a stable dispersion of a solid particle. Here's an air bubble. An air bubble, will go, again, the same thing. Hydrophobes will be in the air, 
hydrophils will be on the outside and the buoyancy of that will create a foam bubble to the point where you have a, a, a bilayer over here. You got a double layer here of the hydrophils. So you have a macro foam, a bubble coming to the surface, stabilized as a result of those uh, surfactant molecules, right? Okay, now I talked about surface pressure. Remember the inverse thinking of surface tension. So there's a relationship between the two terms. I don't want to go too crazy with physics and mathematics, but just picture this. The surface pressure of a surfactant solution at a certain concentration, in this case, let's say 0.1%, is equal to the surface tension of the pure solvent, there's no surfactant in this one, minus the surface tension of the surfactant solution at the same concentration. So there's an inverse relationship, right? It's it, it, in, in this. So here's what I'm saying. If you increase the surfactant concentration, let's say you go from 0.1 to 0.5, what you're really doing is reducing the surface tension. And of course, if you reduce that part of the equation, this goes up, right? And so you're increasing the surface pressure. And that's the whole point. I want you to remember when we're reducing the surface tension, you're throwing those molecules to the interface, you're really increasing the surface pressure. Now, why do I want to share that with you? because I wanna show you a practical example of that, of surface pressure. And we're gonna talk about, I've sprinkled some pepper on water on this plate. And yeah, I can take my finger and try to separate the pepper particles and physically, yeah, some of the particles will, will come apart. But take a drop of a liquid detergent, which is highly concentrated surfactant, and now touch it. And you can see immediately what's going on. Those molecules are coming right to the interface, exerting a surface pressure, which is reducing surface tension, and lowering, and, and, and you see what happened. This happened also with food dye, uh, for example. You'll see another example of that where the, the dye just completely spreads apart because of the concentrated surfactant going into that liquid phase. It happens with wine glasses. I've, if you've ever seen wine tears, or what they call legs, it's the same concept. Uh, so, I mean, the alcohol evaporates from the side of the glass, so therefore there's more water left, so therefore it's a higher surface tension, and so the surface is continuously pulled from the bulk liquid up the side of the glass and liquid pumped up in that fashion accumulates to form what we call wine tears or legs. You may have seen that when you swirl around a liquid water combination. So that's surface pressure. The reason why that's interesting, surface tension and surface pressure differentials is the following. So this is named after Marangoni and Gibbs. It's actually, there are three people, uh, Plateau, Marangoni and Gibbs, this whole concept of surface uh, transport because of surface pressure or surface tension differentials. So picture this panel and you put a water-based coating on top of this panel. And let's say there's a contaminant there. Maybe it's an oil drop, an overspray, whatever. I don't know if you can see the oil drop in that water-based thing. You've got an oil drop, a dirt particle, an overspray, as I mentioned. What will happen is it will lead to film defects. Why? Because of surface tension differentials. What I'm saying is I'm showing here, there's a migration going from something that's low tension to high tension areas. And think of this way, low tension, high pressure to low pressure, the inverse thinking. And this is why you get these film defects. And they come up in different ways. They can be craters, for example, they can be pinholes, they could be fish eyes, all kinds of uh, film uh, imperfections as a result of those contaminants. And so that's why surfactants are employed to try to level out the amount of uh, inter uh, differential between the surface tension and surface pressure. Let's talk about foam control. Let me look at my timing right now. Foam control. We, if we're gonna talk about foam control, then we have to talk about foam stabilization. How, why is foam even generated to begin with? What stabilizes a foam bubble, right? What, so why do these things exist to begin with? And once we understand that, then we can talk about foam control. And there's lots of terminologies you might hear out there, defoaming, de-air and training, anti-popping, non-foaming, anti-foaming, Hopefully I'll try to clarify some of that terminology or that jargon, but let's talk about foam stabilization to begin with. So I have a video here of a bubble wall, a bubble, right? <clears throat> a real zoomed in uh, image of this bubble wall. And you see all these colors. You have cyan, magenta, yellow, black, red, green, blue, white. And basically that deals with the science of optics, which deals with light, constructive and destructive light interference. I'm not gonna go into that. But here's the point. So I got this lamella, the foam bubble wall. And what I did was I superimposed in, a, in, a, in, a, in these symbols with the surfactant molecule. So you see them there. The, again, the hydrophobes in the air on top of the bubble and within, and within the bubble itself right over here, right? On top and within, right? And so the drainage is gonna take place because of gravity. 
So what's going to happen is as the film starts to thin down because of gravitational forces, you're going to get a higher concentration of surfactant molecules right over here. That means much, much lower surface tension or higher pressure. And because of that, there's a driving force that's going to go from the high pressure to low pressure or high tension to low, uh, low tension to high tension. And it helps to restabilize the bubble wall. So this is a constant thing. And if, in fact, this was ionic in nature, which I'm showing here by this, these little charges, it's even worse because you have light charges. And as the bubble wall drains, light charges will repel each other and spring that bubble wall back up again. And so given the same HLB, anionics are more problematic with respect to foam stabilization than non-ionics as an example. So I just wanted you to appreciate how these foam bubbles stabilize. So now that we know how they stabilize, how the heck are we gonna control the foam? Well, let's take a look at this bubble wall again. One way to do it is you can physically separate the molecules. I mean, I could take a pin, for example, disrupt all those intermolecular forces of the, of the micelles, of the, of the surfactant molecules, and, 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 and damage the bubble wall that way, right? So it'll corrupt. That's one way. Of course, we can't do that in the industry. We're going around with needles and pins, bopping all the bubbles. So, but here's another interesting thing. I could take my finger, for example, and do the same thing, where I physically separate these uh, surfactant molecules, but there's something else going on with my finger that the pin did not have. Think about that. My finger also has oil on it. We have an oleophilic, an oil-loving or hydrophobic component on my finger, which is more effective and efficient and is the basis of how defoamers work the way they do. Let me show you an example of that. So here's our lamella, our bubble wall, stabilized by these fact molecules. Along comes a very hydrophobic or oleophilic material. Comes to the interface, spreads along the surface, and guess what? The hydrophobes that are sticking out over here are more interested in going into this area than they are into the air. It's a, it's a better energy state for them to be in, like, likes, like. These hydrophobes would rather be in here than here, and you're destabilizing, you're rupturing the bubble by doing that chemically. So I wanted you to appreciate how the basis of some uh, foam control agents work. De-air and training. I want to share something. What I showed you before was macro foam bubbles at the surface. What about bubbles, micro bubbles within the bulk of the liquid? You know, this is interesting. If you have water and you notice air bubbles, these are pure, pure water, nothing else is in it. What you notice is that larger bubbles ascend to the surface a lot faster than the smaller bubbles. More buoyant. Now, why is that? That follows a thing called Stokes Law, which I'll share with you right now. How quickly those bubbles come up is based on the radius or the diameter of that bubble. And basically, what you, this, is, this is who George Stokes looks like. So here we've got the velocity. This is the ascent, the ascent rate. The velocity of that bubble is directly proportional to the square of its radius and inversely proportional to its viscosity. So basically, what we're doing here is as we increase the radius or the diameter, same thing, but in this case, it's radius squared. It's even worse. Your rate of ascent is a lot quicker. So... Why am I bringing this up? Here's the point. If you can get micro bubbles to coalesce and form a larger bubble and get more buoyancy in a faster rate based on Stokes' law, we can take advantage of that in terms of de-air and training. And, and here's where I'm going with that so I can show you that real quick. Let's take a look at a typical air bubble in, in, in water. And as I said before, you've got these hydrophobes sticking in to the air surface, right? And the hydrophils are in the aqueous, right? And here's a good example. And here's an ABA structure, by the way. This is more like tangential. It doesn't have this AB structure. So it kind of is tangential to the surface. So what I'm trying to show here is if you replace these symbols, these, these illustrations with a typical, let's say, alkyl phenol ethoxylate, which I showed you before, what would happen? You have another micro bubble here. Here comes another, another one stabilized with the same kinds of AB molecules in this case. They try to get together. And of course, they're going to spring back sterically because you've got a lot of stuff here. And the longer this chain is, the more difficult it is for those micro bubbles to get together. And what's worse, with an anionic component, you have these negative charges. So that's why I was trying to explain why foam uh, is more stabilized with anionics or ionic structures. You got light charges here. So if these bubbles try to get together, right? You're going to have things that spring apart further because of repelling forces of light charges, right? Okay. So 
Here's the point. Here's a typical AB. They try to get together. They've got long, sterically hindered ethoxylation units, ethylene oxide units. That's not easy. They spring apart. And so micro bubbles stay where they are, where they come up very slowly. Put that with an ABA surfactant, and it's very different. You don't have these long extensions going out there. These bubbles, these micro bubbles are able to collapse and coalesce and get to that surface a lot quicker. So what, So where am I leading with all this? So for example, when we talk about DRN training or anti-poppy, and it's synonymous, we're basically saying, here's something that has an anti-poppy or a DRN training aid, which is a nice clean film, but without it, here's an example of what would happen. What's really going on? Because if you're not coalescing the bubbles to get to that surface before the skin cures, right? If the water evaporates and you've got a latex binder that's already coalescing, or you've got a solvent-based alkyd or epoxy or urethane, and all of a sudden you have still residual solvent be, still left behind before the skin of the surface cures, and eventually they come out, they'll pop out, and you get you get this kind of uh, these these imperfections. So it's important to coalesce those micro bubbles as, as quickly as you can to escape from that coating. In not, by the way, when they say non-foaming. Just F FYI, when somebody says they've got a non-foaming agent, that doesn't mean anything. All pure liquids, whether it's water, alcohol, vegetable oil, honey, all pure liquids will come, the bubbles will come to the surface and break on their own. There'll be nothing there to stabilize. It may take its time, depending on the viscosity. Remember, going back to Stokes' law, I have to tell you that th there's, an in there's an inverse relationship. Here's the viscosity. If you raise this up, clearly the velocity is going to go down. So, but it will, but the bubble will burst. Right. Let, let me just uh, clear that up. The bubble will burst. So let me do it again. If I raise the viscosity, you can see the denominator is being raised. The, 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 the velocity of that is going to go down, but it will burst because there's nothing to stabilize the bubble. So it may take time to get there, but it will go out. And then anti uh, that was non foaming. So here's an example of an ABA surfactant and why they're interesting in terms of that particular structure with respect to um, non foaming capabilities. So as the water drains, first of all, these molecules are not good enough to form micelles because of that ABA structure. I showed you that they're tangential to the interface, so they don't really get into the, into the water phase that much or into the uh, hydrophobic part that much. So they kind of congregate to the interface. And so when the bubble drains, they're able to quickly fill in all the voids at that interface and still allow the drain, the, the water, uh, the, the bubble lamella water to drain even further. And at the final moment, look what you've got here. You've got hydrophobe to hydrophobe acting over here. And because of the low intermolecular attractive forces, van der Waal forces, these things are going to separate. And as a result, the bubble pops. That explains why some silicone surfactants, acetylenic diols, where the claims are made that they're good wetting agents, but at the same time, do not contribute to any foam uh, issues. And then anti-foam, and you can picture that. You can just mix a couple of these things together with foam stabilizing species, and, and there you go. Um, let's, let's see, 5.36.15, so I'm getting closer. You know what? I was going to share, share with you things like uh, measuring methods. Let me skip by that. I don't want to, I think I've already almost exhausted my time. I can always talk to you about this some other time. I'm going to give you my email address or phone number if you ever want to contact me and talk some more about this. Bottom line is there's two ways of measuring surface tension under equilibrium conditions or dynamic conditions. I'm not gonna go into too much details right now. I do have a lot of graphics to show you. The Denoy ring is the example of a static or equilibrium way. You, sit, you, you, you slip this into the water, you bring it up, you measure the force it takes. Remember the, the very cohesive water, to how long it takes, uh, to how, how much force it takes to separate those water molecules. And I have a video on that, but again, I'm gonna bypass that right now for the sake of time. Then there's dynamic surface tension whereby you, you're, you're submitting tubes into the water phase, you're putting some air in there, and you're measuring the amount of pressure it takes to form bubbles at different lengths. I'm gonna just quickly go by this for the sake of time, because I wanna be respectful of any questions you may have. And you can chart this and find out how much pressure does it take. Bottom line is this, if, you have, if you're trying to put pressure to get an air bubble to escape out of this tube, right? The more efficient, if you have surfactants that go to the interface, you don't require as much pressure. Pascal's here, right? This 300 can now drop down to 280 because we're, we're interfering with the cohesiveness of these water molecules. So the, the ability of good surfactants to get to that interface faster and more concentrated will even reduce that 
uh, pressure less. That's the whole point of the this. So I just wanted to show you some, again, I have some videos on this. I wanted to show you some measurements of surface tension quickly, just pure liquids. Water, as I mentioned before, high surface tension around 72 times per centimeter. Uh, alcohols, you know, you have this, you have, here's an ethanol water. Remember I mentioned surfactants? It's at a very low concentration. Here's a reason why, yes, you could put ethanol into water and reduce the surface tension from 72 down to 28.5. The problem is you need about 50 parts of the alcohol to 50 parts of water to do that. That's not a good example of a surfactant. You need a level between 0.1 to 1%. This requires 50-50 concentration to get to that level. So yes, while alcohols can reduce surface tension, they're not by definition classified as surfactants for that reason. Look at mercury. This is the highest surface tension of a liquid you can get, 487 dynes per centimeter. Here's an aliphatic uh, solvent, an aromatic, an oxygenated solvent, and you can see the kinds of surface tension by themselves. Because you're dealing with water, you're formerly in water-based systems, you've got to concern yourself with water and how to reduce that. And here's why I brought up that whole AB and ABA structure. This is probably my last slide. Under equilibrium conditions, yes, some of these surfactants look great. Going from 72, for example, down to 33, here, 33, 39, 23. Look at fluorosurfactants. They're great. And, and But look at them the dynamic conditions. So the alkyl phenol of foxlet starts to fall apart. And, and we live in a dynamic world. You're mixing, you're blending, you're brushing, you're applying, you're spraying, you're roller coating. You know, you're spreading out those surfaces very quickly. You want to understand how quickly can those surfactant molecules migrate to the interface to reduce the surface tension. That's why measuring surface tension dynamically, whether it's maximum bubble pressure tensiometer or something else, is more important than looking at it with a Denoy a tensiometer. So here's an ABA. And what you can see on the ABA is an example, very respectable under equilibrium and dynamic conditions. Look at the fluorosurfactants. They're very good overall, but I have to say, of course, there's some issues with the uh, eight carbon, uh, uh, you know, polytetrafluor, not the polytetrafluor, the, uh, the ones that are based on octanoic acid. Uh, you've heard of PFAS, uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances, and they don't bioaccumulate. That, I mean, they bioaccumulate. That's the problem. And so, therefore, a lot of suppliers are looking to see how they can get away from the eight carbons um, uh, and get down to four or two carbons. It, it remains to be seen how effective they might be at that level, but I uh, just wanted to share that with you as well. Um, I'm just gonna put on my last slide. If you need to reach me, my, this is my office number. If you wanna email me, uh, sam.morell at sammorell.com. Uh, if you're on LinkedIn, I'd be more than happy to uh, connect with you that way. Just type in Sam Morell, you'll find me there. I've done some YouTube videos. I did one on Rheology quite some time ago. I mean, maybe about uh, six years ago or eight years ago. They're old. I'm going to replace them at some point, but there's a whole series on rheology. Uh, again, you can go to YouTube, just put in my name. You'll, you'll find me uh, quick enough. I plan on doing a, a multi-part series on surfactants as well. And um, so, I, so I would encourage you to subscribe. There's no cost associated with it. And if you notify, if you get, you, you hit that bell icon, when I do put up more videos, you get notified about something like that. So feel, I'll just leave that slide up. Feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'll entertain any questions we have with every limited time that we've got. Travis, I apologize. I ran over more than I thought I was going to. Uh, that's fine, Sam. I think uh, everybody enjoyed the presentation and uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, if you want to contact Sam, please write down uh, his contact information while you have a chance here. Okay, so we're moving into the questions and answers uh, portion of the talk. Okay. Uh, we are going to use the chat function. So if you uh, take a look, um, move your cursor over the Brady Bunch uh, view, you'll see at the bottom chat. And, uh, okay, I'm trying to find, oh, I see the chat icon. I've got it up now. Yep. Great. So uh, if you would, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit them now via chat. Or, or Travis, is it possible if they want to unmute themselves and, and ask me a question directly if they if it takes too much time for them to type it up? Is that a, is that an option? It could happen, yes, as long okay. as we don't get too many people at once. Uh, but I plan on doing Sam. Come on. <laughs> hey, Ben. You can't keep Ben down. No. All right, Ben, you have a question? Uh, well, first I wanted to say, Sam, great, great presentation. Thank you, Ben. Um, 
I loved your graphics. Everything was, was really nice about it. And obviously there's a, some of us who have probably bathed themselves every day in surfactants for the last 40 or 50 years. So it's not like they really needed a, a, a refresher, but it was a great refresher. And I, I just want to say that first. Thank you, Dan. Um, I've always been a fan of the acetylenic glycols uh, the minute they came out and mostly because of their uh, defoaming ability and I've used them for years and years. And, and I actually think some of the original ones are better than the current ones that they uh, developed from them. You know, the, the smaller, shorter, uh, basic acetylenic glycol. Uh, what's your feeling about that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I've heard about those. Um, of course, we don't we don't represent them, uh, but um, what they're trying to do is I mentioned before that they can take advantage of those hydroxyl groups. They're not very reactive, but they but they do work and somehow they're not primary hydroxyl groups and they ethoxylate them so they can have different chain lengths of those ethylene oxide. Usually right. you might hear a series. Again, I'm not going to mention trade names or product names, but you can have something that says 20 percent EO, 40 percent or 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 65 percent or 85 percent EO. And their right. number, their nomenclature reflects that so they can ethoxylate. That's one way. What I've heard they're also looking at is propoxylating them to get even more hydrophobicity on those hydroxyl groups. The other thing I heard that might be a possibility, which is interesting, what you saw on that acetylene diol was a tetramethyl desine. It was a desine, 10 carbons diol. I think they're looking at higher molecular weight analogs. So you have a dodecyl, you have 12 carbons to even broaden up that backbone some more. So they have a lot of wiggle room to play with those types of surfactants to come up with some interesting products. Uh, beyond that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not privy uh, to what else they're doing, but I've heard of those kinds of examples. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, Brian Maxwell, uh, just wanted to say thank you very much. Great presentation. Very informative. Uh, Joe B. How long are the videos? Could you show them while we listen to your answers? <laughs> uh, see, how long are the videos? Uh, you could show them while we listen to your answers. Oh, oh, well, yeah, it'd be hard because then I'm uh, trying to trying to do both at the same time. I mean, I, I can be, <laughs> yeah, um, try to uh, do a couple things at the same time. But what it's I would damp. will do is, um, as I mentioned, I will develop a multi-part series and throw it up to YouTube. If you do go to that channel and just hit subscribe, again, it's no cost. Once they're available, I'll gladly do that. Um, the, the videos aren't that long. Uh, there may be a couple of minutes to show an example of what a denoid tensiometer will do, what a maximum bubble pressure tensiometer will do. Those are the kinds of things. I don't think you miss much. I think many people are familiar with the denoid ring escaping from the water surface and uh, putting, applying a, a, a pulling force on that ring and then measuring how many dynes per centimeter it takes to do that. The maximum bubble pressure tensiometer was a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, but, uh, you know, what, maybe we could do this offline. If you send me an email, uh, maybe there's a way I could share that with you uh, and, or, uh, or, or, or kind of uh, schedule a, uh, a video clip and, and give it to you that way. Hey, Sam, I had, uh, the question I had uh, in relation to that, and I was thinking about asking before, um, is your presentation going to be available to us on our website? I can do that. I can give you, uh, Travis, I can give you what, a PDF? Or Either, yeah, a PDF. And if, you, and if you can embed those videos in there. That's hard. Um, yeah, the, uh, I can only, yeah, I, I can't do that. Uh, I, I can certainly give the PDF where you'll get the gist of everything that I've said um, in words, as opposed to the videos in, in, in that. Plus, uh, uh, well, with all the videos, but what we had tonight uh, will be presented or will be posted to the website at some point. Uh, Ron will be putting it there. It's been recorded. If you want to share it with someone else. Okay, go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just going to say, Sam, call me later because I have some uh, suggestions on how to do that. And, and it may relate to what we're doing later this year for our uh, sink or swim. Okay. So uh, call me later. You have my number. Yeah, yep, I certainly do. All okay. right. Talk to you. Uh, just more in chat. Sandy Farrell said, uh, Sam, I appreciate your teaching ability. You take complicated aspects, make them understandable. Um, Thank you. Joe B., another comment. I'd just like to see how the new technology gives us videos, the maximum bubble. I have called up your YouTube. Very nice presentation. Okay. 
Okay, you're right. The, yeah, the, I didn't. Uh, that, that that's not on YouTube yet. Again, I'll be working on the surfactant, um, uh, a, a multi-part series on surfactants. Uh, the one I have now is on rheology. Uh, and when when that's done, again, if you subscribe, just hit that subscribe button and the bell. You will get a notice, I guess, through YouTube that says uh, Sam's posted another uh, 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 presentation or video series up there. That's the best way to to do that. All right, and here we have a question uh, from Jacob Schick. He says, first, thank you, Sam. If there are multiple unique interfaces present in a system, will the surfactants be selective about the surface they migrate to? What drives this? That's a very good question. Uh, that's who's that, Jacob? Jacob, yeah. right. That's a very good question, yes. You know, it's interesting. Uh, let, let's take pigment dispersion, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. Used to be a company called Atlas. Uh, I think they're now called ICI or something like that. They had a series, and here I'm gonna mention names, but I had nothing to do with them. They called spans and tweens. And have you ever heard of that surfactant uh, jargon, spans and tweens? And what right. they found out in the case of pigment dispersions, they had to regulate, it, you had to match up a surfactant's HLB, again, hydrophil lipophil balance, to match up with the material, the substrate, or the, in this case, the pigment surface with the HLB of that substrate or that surface to, guess the, to get the best wetting or dispersion. So you can regulate the amount of hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity to be substantive to that surface, right? And what they found out empirically was, yes, you can match up the HLB, but what you could do better is if you have a, if you weight average a lower HLB surfactant with a higher HLB surfactant, for some reason that combination, weight average that approximates the HLB of the substrate or the interface will be more effective. So when you're talking about will the surfactants be selective about the surface they migrate to, absolutely, because it depends on the chemistry, the thermodynamics of that interface. And so what you're trying to do is come up with the most appropriate series of surfactants that will get to that surfact that, that interface quicker based on HLB. Again, think about the, the old idea that like likes like or like dissolves like. You know, there's a thing called the Hansen solubility parameters and I, I don't wanna to get too complicated with that, but that is the basis of how molecules work the way they do with other molecules by taking advantage of, you remember I mentioned those Van der Waal forces. You can take a combination of London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole attractive forces and hydrogen bonding, and you can plot it in a three-dimensional way. And if you need to get to a particular chemistry, the best is by matching up all those intermolecular forces with the chemistry you're trying to attract to, and that's the best uh, combination to get to. I hope that answers the question. Spans and tweens were uh, what were used to cre actually create the HLB system that's by that correct. company. That's right, Ben. That's why I brought that up. I don't. Are they still? Are they? Are they around? I mean, does yeah, the ICI own them? They are still around. You can still get. You know, yeah, but I don't know who makes them or what their name is anymore. So. You know, I did when I was working in surfactants a bit more, but I I can't remember. I probably could look, look it up. But yeah, you, they're still available. All right, Mark, while you're already up, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Which you put yeah, up. so I was just wondering, Sam, can you say, you know, with AAPEs being, you know, taken out of everything, and I may have alluded to this the other day, uh, is there a, a specific non-ionic that is becoming more the product of choice when replacing APEs? Yes. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to mention any products per se. I wanted to keep this very non-commercial. I'm not trying to promote anybody's products. People are looking at eight, what they call APO free surfactants, which, and some of them are based actually on natural uh, biomass resources. For example, vegetable oil, right? You've got a lot of good fatty acids in there, whether they're stearic acid or lauric acid. So for example, sodium lauryl sulfate, right? You have a sodium salt of lauryl, which is a dodecyl sulfate, right? So they're looking at mostly those kinds of hydrophobes from things like fatty alcohols or fatty acids, which have no phenolic group associated with them whatsoever. The problem with the APEO is not the ethylene oxide part. It's the phenolic part. Because when you sever that, when that breaks down and you leave that phenolic component behind, that's the one that has mi is mildly bioaccumulating, that's uh, polluting our environment. That's the problem. So, so they're looking at more of the straight chain uh, 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 alcohol ethoxylates, peg ethoxylates, polyethylene glycol ethoxylates, all those kinds of things for the hydrophobe. 
and then leaving the hydrophil alone generally with either ethylene oxide or ionic groups like sulfates, sulfonates, succinates, phosphates, those kinds of materials. That's okay, a big, uh, we're, hearing, we're hearing more of that from companies that are saying they're trying to see, but it's more prevalent in Europe right now than it is here in the United States. We're kind of lagging behind a little bit, but I can envision uh, there's a lot of research activity going on trying to replace APEOs. Uh, yeah. Sam, excuse me, Sam, I have a question. If they're using more sulfates and sulfonates, doesn't they add more foam to the system? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so, it's a premier smaller bubbles too. That you're absolutely right. Well, it depends on again, you can regulate the HLB, right? You can regulate to how much you've got the ionic part, but then you've got the hydrophobic part, right? And that's the disruptive of the bubble wall as well. So you can regulate how much of a hydrophobe do you want. The longer the chain on that hydrocarbon, the better, the more less forming you're going to have because you're you're lowering the overall HLB of that material. But but you're absolutely right. Given the same HLB. Mm -hmm. Ionic materials are going to foam more or be more foam stabilizing than non-ionics. Yeah. And in fact, I mentioned reactive surfactants. So they're looking at that as well. Something to work itself into the backbone. You know, they're, they're, they typically anionic surfactants are, are what uh, most people look at when they talk about reactive, you know, going into the backbone into the, through vinyl addition, through that double bond. So, but there are some companies that are actually looking at reactive non-ionic surfactants into the backbone. So that'll be interesting to see how that will work itself out. But to answer your question, is it Frank? Frank, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Because yeah. you can compensate it, we compensate it with by adding more foam control agents in there, right? Yeah, well, then you add other issues too. That's correct. <laughs> by adding more foam control right. agents. I'm, I'm giving you the mechanism and theory of how things work on a very clean mm -hmm. level. The, the challenge for a formulator is they got to work with a lot of animals in that formulation. Think about it. You got rheology agents in there, right? You got matting agents in there. You got defomers in there. You got dispersants in there. You look at all the, the antioxidants, anti skinning, biocides. Look at all the possible things that would go to the interface and be disruptive with all the other molecules. Mm. What I showed you was very clean systems, right? But mm. I'm just trying to extrapolate so that you can see why certain chemistries work the way they do. And, and Sam, can I make one quick comment? Uh, since we work for a floral surfactant company, there are alternatives out there other than C8, C10s. And, okay. and you need to be aware of that. C6s or lower that can function and give you that low surface tension that you're showing. So. Absolutely, Frank. In fact, and I, I, think, I think I kind of touched upon that very briefly. And that's why companies are looking at the lower carbon level, because it's the, it's the, for some reason, it's the eight carbon that seems to be more problematic in terms of bioaccumulation. Same. But I didn't come across, if you want to share any studies with me, I'd be more than happy to present that in a, in a, in a future presentation to show an eight carbon vis-a-vis -a, -vis a six or a four carbon and how mm -hmm. they relate in terms of static or equilibrium surface tension versus dynamic. Uh, you know, what's interesting about fluoro surfactants, as you well know, I'm sure, Frank, they're great because that carbon fluorine bond is very strong. So they resist everything, oil, water. In fact, think about it. 3M has a product called Scotchgard, which is based on the perfluorooctanoic acid because they're so uh, soil repellent. DuPont had a product called Stainmaster for all the carpets. That was based on PFOAs because of that stain resistance qualities. So there's a, and Teflon, your Teflon pots. PTFE, think about that. Think about all the, where PFASs are used, perfluoroalkyl substances. And so that, that's a little bit of a concern right now. So they're obviously looking for alternatives that can do the same thing. All right, well, that uh, seems to be the end. Thank you very much, Sam, for your very informative and very uh, visually pleasing presentation. Much appreciated. <laughs> and I, I, Travis, I also wanted to take this uh, opportunity to thank you and, and Mark and Ron uh, for helping me out yesterday in terms of just making sure everything worked out well. And I appreciate you coordinating this. <laughs>